I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing f uh, for about the last 25 years at Children's Hospital in Boston. I've been very fortunate to collaborate with some uh, co pediatric cardiologists and cardiac surgeons who are interested not only in the, the hearts of the children who are their patients, but also in, in their brains and importantly on what the potential impact on the children's brains might be of the interventions that they undertake on behalf of the children. So first of all, this is a fairly large patient population. This slide shows that congenital heart defects is actually the most common structural de uh, birth defect in children. About 411 uh, children are born with a congenital, uh, with a birth defect every day in, in the United States. About a fifth of them are children who have a, a congenital heart defect. So this adds up to a big number. Over the course of a year, about 30,000 babies will be born with congenital heart disease, so an incidence of about 1 in 125 births. And a third of these babies will be very sick, requiring uh, urgent intervention in infancy. To, to, to enable them to survive. So congenital heart defect uh, accounts for about 30% uh, of birth defect related deaths, although survival rates have increased dramatically in the last few decades. It used to be that only about 20% of children with congenital heart disease would survive. Now it's over 90%, which means that there are a lot of survivors of congenital heart disease about a million in the U.S. population. And this population is so big, there's now a subspecialty within cardiology called GUCH, grown-up congenital heart disease. So there are cardiologists who specialize in, in taking care of children who have survived into adulthood. And with these increasing survival rates, there's been increasing concern about how these children do in their lives, the quality of their life, specifically the neurodevelopmental outcomes and uh, in, in how we may uh, help the children and their families to improve their outcomes. These are very often very sick babies. As I mentioned, about a third of them will require some kind of intervention very early in infancy. And this shows a, a picture of a child who's about to undergo cardiac surgery with ice packed around the head uh, to cool, cool the baby down, uh, uh, produce a, a hypothermia that will reduce uh, metabolic rate and so reduce the uh, likelihood of some hypoxic injury. And the children are subjected to uh, uh, equipment that's quite unnatural. A lot of plastic tubing, blood flowing through plastic uh, tends to aggregate, the platelets tend to aggregate, increasing the risk of, of stroke. Um, so they're, they're and, the, and the children are on cardiopulmonary bypass for quite long periods of time. So these are, are things that we think uh, we have reason to suspect might not be too good for the brain. But there are a lot of other reasons why these children might be at neurodevelopmental risk as well. First of all, a lot of children with ge uh, uh, genetic syndromes have uh, defects of the heart. And I know that there are many people here interested in the 22Q11 microdeletion. Uh, there's been some work suggesting that children who have the uh, epsilon 2 allele of the apolipoprotein gene are also uh, at risk. This is interesting because it's the e epsilon-4 allele that's thought to confer increased risk of, of Alzheimer's disease in adults, but in children, E2 might be uh, the allele that, that confers greatest risk. And there are a number of other potential um, uh, genetic syndromes, the, the, the charge and the vectoral syndromes that uh, often involve some <coughs> cardiac defect. What kind of lesion, cardiac lesion, the child has may also be very important in predicting their outcome. At one end, we have children with hypoplastic left heart syndrome where the right side of the heart really has not grown properly, so it's fun uh, essentially a single ventricle uh, syndrome. And these children have to undergo a, a series of, of reconstructive surgeries that uh, uh, starting early on and, and extending into childhood. And then there are, are less, uh, less severe syndromes, tetralogy of Fallot, detransposition of the great arteries, uh, which is one that our group is focused on, where the pulmonary artery and the aorta are actually switched. They're transposed, so they, they enter the wrong 
uh, atrium of the heart. And so the children need to undergo what's called the arterial switch operation, which is really a, a plumbing uh, repair, changing uh, the coronary anatomy. And then there are children with uh, fairly mild defects, like an atrial septal defect, a little hole between the two atria that uh, may not even be diagnosed until um, someone reaches adulthood, so often is asymptomatic. And so which of these uh, uh, syndrome or uh, defects a child has may have some implications for their neurodevelopmental outcomes. We also know that the heart and the brain are, are developing at the same time in the fetus. And so there may be congenital abnormalities of, of the, the central nervous system that go along with having a heart defect. And we do know that children with congenital heart disease may have a, a reduced brain volume at birth. There's altered axonal development and metabolism. And we know that oligodendrocytes, which contribute to laying down of, of uh, white matter in the brain, they're, they're particularly vulnerable to the kind of hypoxic ischemic injury that may be associated with having a congenital heart defect. And so this is manifested clinically as white matter injury and specifically peri uh, periventricular leukomalacia in the newborn. And so the children come before they even go to surgery, we know that they have some abnormalities of the brain. Also, the babies are often very sick when, they, when they're going to surgery. We know they, they may have poor cerebral per perfusion due to hemodynamic instability because the pattern of blood flow is, is altered in, in many of these heart conditions. And so the brain is not getting the, the oxygen and the nutrient supply that it needs. These children often have arrhythmias. They suffer cardiac arrest or, or thromboembolic events and they have difficulty feeding, so they may not be properly nourished. We also know that these are very stressful uh, conditions for the family members. And so there's reduced, when these children are in the uh, cardiac ICU, there's reduced opportunity for parent-child interaction and stimulation and formation of the bonding that's so important. And parents are obviously and understandably anxious about these children, about uh, even after their, they go through their surgery, parents are anxious about how, uh, how active their child can be. And so some parents are, are very overprotective and so may reduce opportunities for peer interactions and, and participation in the regular activities of childhood. And then finally, there are the surgical methods that uh, are used in repairing these children. And these are, are what are called iatrogenic factors. They're, uh, they're caused by the medical interventions. And this is important because these are potentially modifiable. And if these methods do uh, have some impact on how the children develop subsequently, then maybe we can modify these factors and produce better outcomes. So uh, among the factors that we've investigated at our hospital are the vital organ support technique used to support the children during cardiac surgery, whether it's deep hypothermia with total circulatory arrest where the heart is stopped, the blood is drained out of the children, leaving the surgeons with a nice uh, bloodless operative field, and, and then they can do the repair and then reperfuse the child, start the heart again, and, and start the circulation. Or, is it better to place the child on a continuous low flow cardiopulmonary bypass during the operation so that there's some perfusion of the brain and kidneys uh, during the surgery? It's not obvious which technique is better. And, and when we did some of our studies, surgeons were using one or the other, but there had been no con direct head-to-head -head comparison of which one was better. Uh, the hematocrit is managed in different ways during the surgery. Some surgeons like to dilute the hematocrit uh, to quite a low, low level of, say, 5 or 7 percent during the surgery to, to reduce the risk of, that the child might have a, develop a clot that would go to the brain. Acid-base management is another option that the surgeons can, um, can, can manipulate. Uh, when, when a child is cooled down to about 65 degrees in deep hypothermia, the uh, dissociation uh, coefficient of water is changed so that to maintain a physiological pH it's necessary to add carbon dioxide into the bypass circuit. Uh, 
And uh, there are two strategies um, for managing acid base uh, balance during surgery. And, and again, uh, we didn't have any data about which one may have better implications for brain development. And finally, I, I mentioned prolonged anesthesia. There's cr currently quite a bit of concern that uh, anesthesia may be neurotoxic to the developing brain. And these uh, children are on anesthesia for, for fairly long periods of time during their, their uh, repair. So there are an awful lot of factors that are potentially related to the neurodevelopmental outcomes of children with congenital heart disease. Now, this is a very interesting patient population. I've had the opportunity in some of our studies to follow children from uh, the, the perioperative period up through 16 years of age and to assess the children on multiple occasions, the same children, over this time. And it's become apparent to me that these are children that don't, um, they don't have garden variety learning and behavioral issues. The problems seem to become more and more apparent as the children get older, and I'll get into uh, the basis for that observation in a little bit. But there's some data from uh, a longitudinal study that was done in uh, Germany by Hovels Gervich, and they followed uh, 60 children with transposition of the great arteries. And when they followed the children in later childhood, between 8 and 14 years, they found that 55 percent, so over half of the children, had an impairment in one or more of the neuropsychological domains that they assessed, uh, cognition, academic skills, language, speech, uh, or a, a neurologic exam, and that about 7% had uh, impairment in all of these domains. But this was about twice the rate that had been observed in the same children when they were assessed at five years of age. So there seemed to be some kind of unfolding progressive process that was underway here, that it, the, the children's limitations became more apparent as time went by. Now, the first observation I, I, I wanted to make is that IQ, which we always measure in these studies, doesn't really tell us very much about these children, about their strengths and their weaknesses. In many cohorts, the mean IQ is no different than 100, which is the, what you would be, expect in, in the general population. Usually it's a few points lower, maybe in the high to, or mid-90s, but certainly uh, there's pl there are plenty of children walking around with IQs in, in that range that, that are doing just fine. And this is true, re quite remarkably, even in, in cohorts of children, at least recently, who have these very complex single ventricle lesions, such as hypoplastic left heart, or even children who have undergone heart transplantation. Now, the, the only thing I would say is that in many cases, the variability, the standard deviation of the IQ scores may be a little broader, indicating that there are more low-functioning children than you would expect in the general population. But on average, the groups are doing quite, quite well. So the implication of this is if we want to do surveillance to identify children with congenital heart disease at risk of neurodevelopmental problems, if we relied only on IQ, we would have a, a fairly high rate of false negatives. We would under-identify children who, in fact, seem to be at, at neurodevelopmental risk. One way of illustrating this is, is to show the frequency of significant ability achievement discrepancies, which means a discrepancy between a child's IQ and their academic performance in some area like reading or math. So these are data from a study we did, a uh, longitudinal study of children with transposition, where we, at eight years of age, we assessed both their IQs and their uh, academic skills. And this shows the percentage of children who had a significant uh, discrepancy in the direction of uh, performing lower than expected in an academic area lower than expected based on the child's IQ. So they weren't, weren't reading as well, for instance, as you would expect based on their IQ. So 15% of children's reading, children were, had a reading comprehension score significantly lower than, than their IQ, and 11% overall for reading. It was interesting to me that 3% of children were low in terms of their basic reading skills, which meant single word reading, but five times that 
uh, frequency were significantly low in terms of their ability to apply those skills to extract meaning from connected uh, discourse or, or a, dis a connected narrative. Now, the, I saw the same pattern in mathematics. The, the basic reasoning skills uh, were generally intact, but the application of those skills to actually carry out math uh, calculations was much more frequently impaired. And what this said to me was that the basic lower level skills, both in reading and math, seemed to be OK, but it was some higher order application of these component building block skills in the service of higher needs or higher skills where the children seem to be having some trouble. And, and this foretold some of the issues around executive functioning that I'll uh, talk about in a minute. This is another study that uh, we did quite recently on children with another cardiac defect, Tetralogy of Fallot, where we looked at the same sort of uh, discrepancy between their IQs and their, their academic skills. And here we needed to stratify by whether or not the children had a genetic diagnosis. Uh, transposition tends to not involve any genetic syndromes, but uh, tetralogy does, uh, and often the 22Q11. And again, we saw uh, fairly high rates of, um, uh, of significant deficiencies in these academic skills, and particularly in the area of math. And whereas there wasn't much difference between the no genetic diagnosis and genetic diagnosis group uh, with regard to reading, there was a very big difference in terms of math skills. And I think math and visual spatial skills often travel together. And uh, as you'll see shortly, visual spatial skills are a big problem for these patients. And these uh, discrepancies between ability and achievement are manifested in terms of quite high rates of need for remedial services. These were uh, the children in the transposition uh, of the great arteries group at age eight. And here we needed to stratify by uh, whether they had an intact ventricular septum or ventricular septal defect. And this was a study where a randomized trial where we compared total circulatory arrest versus uh, uh, deep hypothermia with continuous low flow bypass. But the important point is that all four of these groups had uh, at, at least 30 percent and in, for some subgroups uh, up close to 60 percent of the children needed to go for special help in school. So even though their IQs were fine, they were not making the progress that they were expected to make in school. Now another problem that we've seen very consistently in these patients is problems with speech and language. And in terms of speech production, uh, when I tested these babies when they were around 12 months of age, I was struck that they were very quiet. There was very little babbling. And in fact, as the children got older, we, uh, we had a speech pathologist to evaluate them and identified very high rates of oral motor coordination and speech planning problems. Now, with this manifested as a reduced ability to imitate oral movements. So if you tell a child, stick out your tongue, uh, most children don't have any trouble with that, but these children did. Or to say, pataka, as rapidly as you can, pataka, pataka. The children uh, would get tongue-tied, and they would mix up the, the syllables. And in their uh, free speech, they would have lots of phonological problems. They would reduce clusters, so STR, they would say, is ST and drop the R. So simplifying, they would omit consonants, uh, usually in the middle and at the end of words, and they would transpose their syllables, so produce malapropisms. So these kids were very hard to understand, unless you were a parent, and uh, unless you were in the same context with the child so that you could use visual cues, their speech was very hard to understand. And this was not because their oral musculature was altered in some way, and they didn't have reduced hearing. We tested both of these. So as a, a result of these uh, speech production problems, fairly high percentages uh, of these children had what uh, uh, they met clinical definition of oral motor apraxia. Uh, 
here was at four years and even by eight years, still um, about 12-13% uh, of the children met clinical criteria for apraxia. Now, the the, the uh, language problems of these children was not limited to just their speech production. In fact, by four years of age, their, somat their, their mastery of syntax and semantics seemed pretty good, but there was something odd about the way they used language in social relationships. You know, language is, is useful because we do things with it. We, we form relationships with people. We, we, we get them to do things through language. And there was something off about the children's language. And so I formed a collaboration with some psycholinguists at the Harvard Graduate School of Education who are expert at what's called pragmatic language. And they provided me with some tasks that I administered to the children to try to probe this aspect of language. And this is called uh, elicited personal narratives. So what happened was I would provide a model for the children of telling an anecdote from the past. I would say, you know what I did last summer? I went on vacation and I went up to the north and I went to a beach and went swimming. Did you ever go swimming at a beach? And the child, every child has done that and so they would, I would say, tell me about that. And, and we would tape record it. And we'd had um, two other narratives. One was about getting stung by a bee and the other was by, about having a spilling accident. Again, these are things that, that most children have experience with. So we uh, elicited three narratives and chose the best of the three narratives to use in group comparisons. Now, in uh, characterizing these narratives, we, we developed a total score, and this was a combination of elements at the clause level, so uh, asked whether or not the child oriented the, the, the listener, me, in terms of who was involved, what happened, where, and when. So provided some kind of markers to indicate these uh, critical pieces of information. And then uh, whether they told a, a story that, that had a, a clear logical sequence of actions that had some kind of plot. And then we had characteristics of the overall organization, so whether the story had an opening and a closing, whether it was enriched by having characters actually uh, produce speech, and again, temporal markers to say what happened first, then second, then later, and then whether there was a, a high point, the child clearly was indicating some kind of pivotal event that, that uh, brought the whole thing together. So then we look to see, um, the, uh, compare the scores. Based on the reference group, we defined an average uh, narrative, one that was above average and one that was below average, and first of all, we found that 15% of the children in uh, our TGA group didn't produce any narratives that could be coded at all. They simply sat there and looked at me and, and couldn't come up with any personal anecdote. And then uh, the other, um, about 80% of the children, um, or another 40%, uh, produced narratives that were uh, well below average. In, compared to the um, uh, referent group of typically developing children. And you can see there was big differences in terms of the percentage of children in the, in the <coughs> congenital heart disease group and the referent group that were average. Uh, not too much difference in terms of the above average here. But clearly the children uh, were having trouble with this task. And there were some interesting observations too in terms of the children's social cognition development, I felt, that compared to controls, there was very infrequent reference to the story participants' affective states. That is, they didn't talk about how the, the uh, people involved in, in the, the uh, episodes felt, whether they were happy or scared or you know, surprised by getting a bee sting or happy about being at the beach. Uh, there didn't seem to be much to the interior life of, of the uh, participants. And they didn't refer very often to the, the plans and intentions of the participants. And they made greater demands on the listener to infer in a lot of information to fill in. That is, they, they just didn't seem to be able to uh, anticipate the needs of the listener 
and, and then provide the information that would orient the listener as to what was happening to whom and when and, and what it all meant. So at age four, the narratives of the children resembled those of typically developing two to three year olds. And I repeated this task when the children were age eight and they had improved, but they were still only uh, similar to the narratives of typ typically developing five year olds. We also had the children engage in a free play task with their parent. Uh, this was at age four. And all pairs, parent-child pairs, were given the same standard set of toys. And what we coded was symbolic or non-symbolic talk. So symbolic talk was talk about characters, the imagined actions, speech and states, the story setting, and um, meta-symbolic talk. Let's pretend that we're going to give the dog a bath, or let's pretend that we're going to rearrange the furniture in the living room. And non-symbolic talk was mainly labeling of objects. Uh, this is a dog, uh, or saying, let's put these here without any sort of um, uh, action sequence that, that the child is, is implementing. It's simply, let's put these here and put those there. Or allocating toys, saying, this is my, uh, dog, this is my car, that's your car. And then we also coded the number of story episodes. The, these were symbolic sequences of at least two actions that were logically linked with a setting, participants, and an intention. So this is the, we're, we're giving the dog a bath, or we're going to load up the car and go to the beach. So when we looked at the, um, the speech that the children in the TGA and the control group produced, there was no difference in the overall production or the mean length of their turn taking. The children were talking as much in the TGA group as control, but they differed a lot in what they were talking about. So the controls were uh, about half of the time their speech was symbolic, okay, so uh, quite a rich content, far more than uh, in the TGA group. And the TGA group was engaging in, in a more non-symbolic talk, sort of nuts and bolts talk about the toys but uh, nothing uh, richer than that. And then when we looked at the number of symbolic play episodes that the parents and the children engaged in, we saw a mirror image here. About two-thirds of the uh, TGA and uh, children and parents didn't have any uh, sequences that met our definition of a symbolic episode, whereas about two-thirds of the control pairs had it three or more symbolic play episodes, and this was just in the space of about seven to ten minutes. And what we found was that the children in the control or the referent group took a major role in constructing and elaborating these play episodes. That is, they, they played a character or they narrated the action, and they, they helped to move the events along. They were really fully uh, uh, full participants in this, whereas the children with TGA they, they were really not. They, the, the pairs didn't engage in much of this kind of um, joint activities. The, the children were uh, producing the, the, the isolated symbolic actions. They repeated actions. And they, they had a lot of sound effects, making sounds of the car or the dog. But the, it was the parent doing most of the work, providing most of the scaffolding for any, any of this episodic-like uh, activity that was going on. It was not the child. We also had a, a, a pragmatic language task that involved the children writing stories in response to a, a standard set of three pictures which showed a group of bears in a, a, a forest. They were flying a kite. And in one of the pictures, the kite gets stuck in the chair. And one of the bears goes up into the uh, tree to get it. And then the bear falls out of the tree and in the last picture, the other bears are carting this fallen bear away. So we had the children write a story, and we coded um, the structure and the content. So whether or not the children included all these key structural elements, uh, an introduction of what was happening, oriented the, the, the reader of the story as to what the, the tension was, the problem, and then how it was resolved and then whether or not the appropriate elements of the content 
the, 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 the players and the events were, were represented in the story. And as with the elicited personal narratives, we found that the stories of the children with TGA were less likely than those of the children in the control group to, to identify the key uh, items other than the bear and the kite, and uh, less likely to provide uh, the reader with information about the events that were critical in giving the narrative its temporal coherence and structure. That is, the event that precipitated the bear's fall from the tree or the consequences to the fall. And I might mention the kids had terrible handwriting. These were eight-year-olds. It was hard, hard to read these, even uh, to do the coding. And you can imagine a child, so this is a child eight years old in second, third grade, a child who has to invest this much effort in the physical act of producing words on the page doesn't have a lot of cognitive space left over to think about what it is they're writing. So they're, they're behind the eight ball right from the start by virtue of their fine motor problems. Another area <clears throat> of striking weakness in these children is visual spatial skills. This is a task called the Ray Ostreich complex figure, <clears throat> which is a very rich figure copying task. This is presented to the child and they're given a blank piece of paper and asked to copy it. And this is kept in front of them while they do that. If the child sees that this is a big rectangle with diagonals, this, that's very important because then they can locate all the other details around this strong structure. But if the child has difficulty seeing the big picture, seeing the forest, and instead is stuck in the trees, then this becomes a very difficult task. So this is a pretty good copy by an eight-year-old of this task. The only thing wrong is that this vertical here doesn't make this junction up here. But all the other details are preserved. I'm going to show you a lot of different uh, copies now. And these are all copies. And here's the, the figure as it should be down here. You can see that this doesn't preserve any of the large structure. The child is making the task much harder than it has to be by drawing the individual elements. There's a very piece-oriented approach instead of a configurational approach. This shows a, a very interesting tendency. For instance, look at this portion up here. This is another uh, rectangle with diagonals, but what this child sees is not the overall structure, but a series of rectangles. And so the child draws the rectangles individually rather than the entire figure. This is really impoverished <clears throat> in terms of the, 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 the structure. Some of these start to look like uh, abstract paintings. And children also did a lot of perseveration, especially with these cross-hatching. They just got going and they couldn't stop. Here's another example of perseveration with just stringing out these uh, uh, triangles. And I would say to the children, so after they finish, so this looks like that? And they would say yes. Here's another example of this real perseveration. I like this one. It sort of has a three-dimensional quality going off into space. And this is the ultimate part-oriented approach. This is, this is the copy a child produced, just isolated details, no, not seeing how they relate to one another whatsoever. So these were actually hard to score, as you can imagine, by the standard scoring procedures available. So I got Jane Holmes Bernstein, who developed the developmental scoring system for this Ray Ostreich, to help me. And we did just a clinical sort of the, of the children's copies. We sorted them into five groups based on their degree to which they preserved the overall structure of the figures, so from worst to, to best. And then we looked to see whether or not this bore any relationship to how the children were doing in school. Because you might say, well, who cares whether a child can draw this figure? You don't, this is not a real life skill. But when we looked to see 
how the children were doing in school, whether or not they needed re uh, to receive remedial services, we found that the children who, were, who produced the worst Ray Osterreith copies, more than half of them were receiving remedial help in school versus about 10% of the children in the best category with a very nice dose-response relationship <clears throat> in between. So this clearly is a skill that has some real-world implications for how children uh, are, are going to be doing in a very important environment. Now, I followed up these children with TGA at age 16, as I mentioned, and many of the children have gotten a lot better in terms of their Ray Osterreith, but many have not. So this is an example of one, a copy produced by a 16-year-old, again, with the, the, the figure right in front of him, and this is his immediate recall of the figure. And here's another example from a 16-year-old. So clearly not complete recovery. Uh, just in the last few weeks, I've tested quite a few ch children with hypoplastic left heart for a, a study that we're doing. These are adolescents, and they also have tremendous difficulty. This child actually rotated the copy, wanted to rotate the copy and draw it vertically, but I wouldn't let him. So instead, he made the task really difficult by drawing it in the vertical orientation while looking at it in the horizontal orientation. And so as a result, he got several things quite wrong. Here's another adolescent with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And another one. So this is a very sensitive task uh, for the difficulties these children have. Now, I don't think this is just an, uh, a visual spatial skill, but it's an executive function skill. These children have tremendous planning uh, and, and organizational difficulties. So as I mentioned when I was talking about the academic skills, I think the children have lower level skills that are generally intact, but they fall short when they need to apply these skills in the service of something else. So when they need to apply their word reading skills to read for meaning. And they have uh, other aspects of language. Their basic syntax is fine, but they can't do things with language. They can't use those syntactic skills to tell a story. And the same with, um, with the math skills. So I think they have difficulty integrating and coordinating these skills to accomplish higher order goals. So they have lots of trouble in their real life with organizing, getting started on tasks, monitoring their performance, making sure they have the, the, the tools that they need, uh, adapting their strategy uh, when uh, they get the feedback that something isn't going right. Uh, and so they overall have a lot of difficulty structuring, pacing, and monitoring their behavior. And that's why I said at the outset, these are kids that are frequently missed by their schools because they don't have garden variety learning disabilities. They can read individual words. And these kinds of tasks, these, these skills, tend to come in in later elementary school and middle school and then high school when the children are given more responsibility to structure their own academic activities, to do long-term projects, to figure out how to budget their time. And, and this is something these children have a lot of trouble doing. And the children have no insight into these difficulties. As part of our, our, a study we did of children with Tetralogy of Fallot, we had three informants fill out a, a questionnaire, the Behavior Rating Inventory of Executive Function, called the brief. So we had the, the children themselves, a parent, and the teacher fill out the brief. And on the brief, a high score is worse than a low score. And there are three main scores. The BRI is the Behavioral Regulation Index. So this is uh, uh, whether children can in initiate tasks, whether they can shift their strategies when they run into an obstacle, whether they can uh, regulate their emotions or whether they tend to fly off the handle. Metacognition Index is, is, is primarily the organizational and planning. Uh, issues and the general executive composite index is a combination of these two. So the mean, expected mean score on the brief, this is a T-score, so you'd expect a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. These are adolescents with tetralogy with no genetic diagnosis and they think they're doing just fine in terms of executive functions. The parents see the children as having 
more problems, particularly of the planning and organizational type, with a, a mean score that's uh, inching up towards one full standard deviation above expectation. But the teachers really are the ones who are picking up on the limitations of the children. They have scores that are uh, more than a one standard deviation above expected. And this, isn't, uh, this is also true of children with tetralogy who do carry a genetic diagnosis. The children themselves think everything is fine, but the parents and the teachers see real problems, especially in terms of the planning and the organization. Attention is another problem for these children. We gave a continuous performance test to children with TGA, and we found increased rates of errors of commission and omission, and frequently the children were uh, producing multiple responses rather than just the one response uh, required. Uh, another study in Germany used a battery, the attention network test, uh, and this was children with tetralogy, and they scored worse on a test uh, that assessed uh, executive control, resolving conflicts between responses. So uh, attention executive functions are sometimes hard to, to uh, distinguish, uh, but clearly within both areas these children were having difficulties. And in another study done in Philadelphia at age 5 to 10 on an ADHD rating scale, the scores of clinical concern were three to four times more frequent among children with complex heart disease than controls, and about a third had high-risk scores on attention or on hyperactivity. And you, as you can imagine, some of these um, neuropsychological problems place the children at risk of, of uh, difficulty in their psychosocial adjustment and their peer relationships. And in this uh, cohort of children with transposition, we had the parents report at age eight using the child behavior checklist, and about a quarter of the children were in the borderline or clinical range on adaptive functioning, which captures the children's range of activities they're involved in, their social relationships, and their school performance. And we had teachers also report on the, the teacher form of the CBCL, and about 20% of the children were in the borderline clinical range in terms of academic functioning. Uh, internalizing and externalizing behavior problems were about the same frequency, but both parents and teachers identified uh, attention as a particular problem for the kids. We did find that children who earlier on had had evidence of CNS impairment, such as post-operative seizures, or in abnormalities on a neurological exam at age four or eight were rated by the teachers as having more behavior problems. And children who had more teacher rated um, uh, indications of poor academic function at eight had showed a greater shift towards more problematic behavior between four and eight than children who were making adequate progress. So, these academic problems and psychosocial problems were going hand in hand, not too surprisingly. And we found that the teacher ratings of the children at age eight were uh, predicted by parent reporting family characteristics at age four, uh, as it, uh, reflected on the parenting stress in inventory and, and a life events inventory. So this is consistent with the causal association between early fi family dynamics and later child behavior, although we can't um, exclude the possibility that child behavior had already, prior to age four, been affected by parent reports of family dyna dynamics. But at least this is one uh, hypothesis that's consistent with the associations that we saw. Now, one of the uh, things that, uh, based on the evaluations that I've done of these children, have led me to form the, the hypothesis that these children have social cognition deficits and maybe deficits in theory of mind, in, in reading other people's uh, emotions and perhaps their own emotions. So on the pragmatic uh, language test, you recall I said the, they infrequently made reference to participants' affective states, internal states, uh, or to participants' plans and intentions. They didn't engage in a lot of symbolic sequences in free play, and their written narratives, uh, as well as their elicited narratives, just didn't seem to be taking account of, of the, the, the internal, the, the mental states of the person they were talking to and doing what they needed to do in order to uh, 
fully engage in, a, in an exchange with that person. So in our later studies, uh, we've been administering some social cognition tests. And some of you are probably familiar with this, the reading the mind and the eyes test developed by Simon Baron Cohen, where child is just shown photograph around the eye region and then given four choices and asked to say, what is this person thinking or feeling? So the, t the task consists of 36 of these pictures. Anybody have a guess? Serious. Serious. That's right. How about this one? Desire, right? So you can see if, if an adolescent mistakes uh, desire for disgust, uh, pe peer relationships are probably not going to be too strong. <laughs> Cautious? That's right. So how do the kids do? This is a distribution of the scores on this test from Baron Cohen's normative sample. So this is where the mean of the TGA kids is. It's down around 20. And the TOF, the Tetralogy of Fallot Children, especially the ones with a genetic syndrome, the white arrow, are down around 17. And the, the Tetralogies without a genetic syndrome are around uh, 18. So clearly, this is a, a task that these children find very, very difficult. We're also administering some other of Baron Cohen's questionnaires, the autism spectrum quotient, the empathy quotient, and the systematizing quotient. And these, these kids are doing significantly worse than the uh, norming samples on these tasks. Uh, there's a recent paper by Calderon from uh, Switzerland, I, I believe, where they specifically administered um, a, a theory of mind tasks, first and, and second order false belief stories to children with TGA. And they, they found significant differences. Uh, the red are, are the, the uh, kids who passed, and, and the blue who failed on these two tasks. And you can see uh, the TGA group is uh, passing less frequently than the, the controls on the first order, and especially on the second, or, uh, second order false belief stories. So confirming this um, hypothesis a little bit more. So uh, I had written a paper proposing that these kids may have theory of mind deficits, and it proposed several hypotheses for why this might be. So the same factor that results in abnormal development of the heart may injure areas of the brain that are involved in processing social affective information. Or it could be that social cognition deficits result from interventions to correct heart defects or that the social cognition de defects are secondary to the neuropsychological deficits associated with congenital heart disease or its repair, such as visual, spatial, or executive function skills. Or it could be that early experiences prevent the normal development of emotion regulation and the kind of intersubjectivity that enables one to read others. So uh, I think these, it, uh, the, and these are not mutually exclusive. It could be more than one of these mechanisms. So what are the predictors of outcomes in children with congenital heart disease? That's really the question if we want to try to help these children. Is, is there anything modifiable that we can do? Uh, I mentioned we've been doing some randomized control trials uh, of different surgical methods at, at Children's Hospital in Boston, and this shows some, some of them. Um, I'm afraid I have to, to tell you that we haven't found that any of them really have dramatic impact on the outcomes of these children. We did find that the longest, longer duration of total circulatory arrest uh, did seem to, to um, be related to neuropsychological outcomes. And we, we uh, used non-parametric regression to see where there was, if there was a cut point beyond which a, a duration of do, uh, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest beyond which there was a significant decline in neuropsychological performance. And we did see that there was a, a general convergence of around 41 minutes. If the children were on circulatory arrest for more than 41 minutes, they seemed to have a problem. And the lower confidence bound was around 30 minutes. So what we recommend is that 
uh, if a child does need to be on circulatory arrest, that it, uh, any individual run be limited to about 30 minutes. But anywhere below 40 minutes didn't seem to confer any risk to the children. So that, that was some good news. Um, one factor that we have consistently seen to be predictive is whether or not the child had post-operative seizures. And we did, um, we had uh, both clinical seizures noticed by someone, or we had um, children work on continuous uh, uh, EEG, uh, continuous um, EEG monitor for 48 hours post-operatively. And some children had, you know, some children post-operatively are basically paralyzed, and so they, you, it's difficult to see a clinical seizure, but you can see it on the EEG. So we found that um, children who had clinical seizures post-operatively had IQ scores at age four that were almost a full standard deviation lower than the population e expectation in terms of full scale and verbal and about two thirds uh, of a, a standard deviation on performance. And if a child had a e uh, seizure just on, on the EEG, they had about um, a little, uh, little over half a standard deviation uh, lower scores uh, on IQ. And in this same cohort of children with TGA, we've seen the same thing at age 16 years, that post-operative seizures, either clinical or EEG, is associated with uh, drops of about 12 points in, in reading, of a standard deviation in math, um, 10 points on a, a two-thirds of a standard deviation on memory, uh, on executive function, um, this is a 10-point scale, so it's about half a standard deviation. Same with visual spatial skills. And we've seen that seizing predicts performance on reading in the mind and the eyes on, the, on this theory of mind test. In terms of predicting an MRI abnormality, the only thing we found predicting it is whether or not the child had high catheterization exposure, just defined as more than three diagnostic caths or more than two interventional caths. And you can see the odds ratios are pretty high, uh, between 10 and 20, depending upon whether it's for any abnormality, for a focal or multifocal abnormality, or for what we saw as the most common, just a brain mineralization iron deposit. Probably it's a hemosiderin. It's probably uh, uh, the, the residue of a, 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 a microinfarct or, or a little hemorrhage, a bleed in, into the brain. Uh, usually at around the time of surgery. But we didn't see, most, most of the intervention uh, factors did not predict children's outcomes. It was how sick the babies were and what, before they went to surgery, and, and so general level of medical morbidity, and then whether or not they seized post-operatively. We've uh, recently done a study of children with single ventricle lesions through the Pediatric Heart Network and seen uh, uh, very similar res uh, uh, set of results. What was predictive of children's outcomes was the center where the, this Norwood procedure, which is the first stage of this um, repair that children with sin uh, single ventricle lesions has, has to undergo, was performed. And then birth weight, presence of a genetic syndrome, maternal education, the number of days the child was on the ventilator after the Norwood procedure, and the number of complications between hospital discharge after Norwood and age 12 months. What wasn't predictive was everything else about the surgery, the perfusion method, the duration of circulatory arrest, the type of shunt that was used uh, during the Norwood, acid-base management, and hematocrit management. So uh, I think the surgeons are off the hook here. And what they're doing is not the major predictor of, of how these children do down the road. So as a result of all this work, 25 years of work, at a Children's Hospital in Boston, we've recently organized what we're calling the Cardiac Neurodevelopmental Program. It's become obvious to us that this patient population is falling into the cracks. They aren't being picked up by their schools, or their general pediatricians. And so as a result, it's all that their problems are being identified at a rather late stage. And we think that identifying them earlier would be beneficial. So we've developed this program that any child who has undergone cardiac surgery within the first year at our hospital uh, 
uh, is eligible for this program. Also, any child of any age who's been placed on ECMO, usually as a bridge to transplantation, uh, and, and we know is is a fair. It's a fairly uh, a risky intervention, but sometimes that's all that uh, will keep a child alive. Any child who, at any age, uh, who's pre or post transplant or having a heart lung transplant, child of any age who's on a ventricular assist device, again, this is usually a bridge to tr heart transplantation, or a child of any age diagnosed with velocardiofacial syndrome. So what do we do for these children? We, we provide a comprehensive psychological assessment to address uh, all of these concerns. So every, this is done before the child is, is discharged initially from the hospital post-surgery. There's a meeting with the parents, uh, a, a, an evaluation of the child, and, uh, uh, and, and anticipatory guidance for the parents as to what to expect. We also are providing guidance and support for expectant parents whose, we, whose babies have been diagnosed in utero with cardiac disease, so it's not a a surprise uh, when the baby is born, the parents have some preparation. We are uh, providing interventions for parents and families to address uh, a lot of the regulatory disorders that these children have. They have trouble feeding and sleeping and a lot of behavior difficulties, so we're trying to anticipate those problems and help uh, families identify uh, uh, emergent problems. And then we working with schools to, to design and implement special education services for the children. And then there are some ancillary uh, elements as well. We're trying to develop a network of community resources to provide seminars, uh, educate parents about these issues, to provide groups for the children and their siblings uh, to, to, uh, so everybody understands uh, what the challenges that, that they, these children will face, and a school consultation program, again, to advocate on behalf of these children. And of course, we're trying, we have a research component too. We want to develop a registry uh, of children with congenital heart disease so that will be a clinical and a, a standard collection of, of data will be collected on all of these children to support uh, a clinical and uh, research studies in the future. And this is an issue that's resonating uh, other centers at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Emory University. They're organizing very similar programs and along these lines to, to help this, uh, what I think has been a neglected patient population. And thank you very much. David, most of the associations you showed were with structural heart defects that require these sort of very draconian interventions mm -hmm. very early in life. Have you looked at whether arrhythmias are related to outcomes? Uh, things like Timothy syndrome or CPVT, uh, whether they predict uh, an impairment in neurological functioning? You know, we haven't. We've collected that information, but it's mainly for instance, a table one in a paper comparing the rates of, of uh, complications you know, in different groups. But we haven't looked at those as independent predictors. That's an yes, interesting suggestion. So, Hi, thanks, David. It was a great talk. I, I'm just wondering if in some of your genetic syndromes that you've looked at, if you've compared children with the same genetic syndrome, some of whom have cardiac congenital heart disease and some of them who don't like for instance, velocardiofacial or 22Q deletion syndrome. So you have them as their own comparisons? Yeah. No, we haven't done that. Uh, in fact, we haven't focused on 22Q11 itself. Uh, it sounds like we should. Um, ex except that a as it occurs in children primarily with the hypoplastic left heart and, and tetralogy, but not without a heart defect. It down syndrome. Down, down, yeah, tries to be 21, yeah. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Um, to a clinician who works with older, higher functioning kids with autism, I, I note striking similarities um, between our patients and your patients. And it looks like also your patients have something um, that's referred to as a nonverbal learning disability. Mm -hmm. Have you um, heard about that label? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, it describes a lot of kids with um, some of the reading comprehension deficits and mathematics deficits. And the and pragmatic so that, language and, 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 and pragmatic reading, language. reading other people, and yep. white matter injury. Yep, yeah. you got it. 
Um, and so it made me curious, um, do your kids have friends? Are they having active social difficulties above and beyond social cognition problems you've documented? And what about their motor uh, development? Yeah, um, they, they have substantial motor problems. Um, I, I didn't present those data, but uh, we, we, at age four, we presented the Peabody motor developmental scales, and the mean scores on both the gross and the fine motor scales were around 80. Uh, they're just not very coordinated kids, uh, not comfortable moving through space, I, partly their visual spatial skills. They also couldn't find their way around. I, I, I noticed that um, after breaks, I would ask, go, go and get them from the, the break room and ask them to f find the room that we were in, and they could never find it. Um, and they had uh, you know, difficulties on tasks like the, the grooved pegboard. And I think that goes along with their penmanship difficulties as well, just controlling the, the pencil tip. Um, but in terms of friends, um, there, there is an Asperger quality to a lot of these kids. They, 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 I'm blinded when we have, a, we have studies that have kids with heart defects and controls, but I'm almost always sure who's who. Just because, uh, you know, you get a, especially with teenagers, uh, a normal teenager is actually not that hard to pick out. You know, they're kind of bubbly, they make contact, <laughs> but um, the cardiac patients, they, they have kind of, they don't give you much. Their faces are kind of stone-like. And they, they answer your questions, but they don't elaborate. And you can tell jokes and they don't laugh. You know, they're just different. And I, um, I, I can't imagine that their peer relationships are, are all that broad and, and satisfying. But it's not something that I probe about either. Uh, we do have a component uh, that's uh, doing a, a psychiatric interview to get at those sorts of things, but we haven't looked at the data yet. I think that'll be really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was really interesting. I have two questions. One, have you compared the neuropsychological profiles of your patients and preemies, extremely low birth weight children who also spend a lot of time in the NICU and are vulnerable child, children as well. So the parent-child relationships are distorted and the children have, they're sedated for long periods of time, lots of you know, similar kinds of early life experiences. Yeah, I, I've been struck by the similarity in the profiles and it gets to the, to the nonverbal learning disability comment earlier. And, it, and preemies are, uh, you know, white matter lesions are, are, are the primary uh, basis of, of the, the, uh, the injury there as well. So I think that there are a lot of commonalities uh, and, and pr probably their final common pathway is shared. So maybe it's not really about the genetic cardiac problem per se, especially in the children who've had all the surgery, but more about the kind of early life experiences, psychosocial and medical? It may be, it may be, yeah. You're thinking the NICU experiences. Well, uh, that there's something about being confined to a warmer for three months or however, how, as you said, and is true for preemies too, the longer you're in the hospital, yeah. the more sick you are, the worse your outcome. There's so many variables here, uh, and most have never been considered, I think, by the neonatologists. Uh, Hi, um, I'm Gary Raff, I'm one of the congenital heart surgeons here. Um, I really enjoyed you telling everyone that it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy, happy to say it. <laughs> but um, I, I trained at CHOP, and Gil came out here at Gowernowski uh, a couple of months ago and talked to us a little bit about the program that they, they've got yeah. there. And one thing that was striking to me was um, his sense that, in fact, it, he didn't present all the data, but his sense that the longer you were in the ICU, the lower your IQ. And he gave us a statistic somewhere around 1.6 points per day, something like that. <laughs> but, you know, it it's, sort of sounds hokey, but the more that I look at these patients and the more I see how we treat them in the ICU, uh, and when data comes out like what 
was recently published in New England Journal about the effects of ketamine. Um, it sort of makes me rethink what are we doing with these patients with sedation? Um, certainly the, the patients who fly off the ventilator do very well. They seem to do better. I think most people would have that gestalt. But do you have any sense of what you may be doing differently now in the ICU versus what you were doing then? Have you changed any of your practices based on some of the uh, circa rest data, for instance? Um, Gil would be the better one to answer that. I, I, I don't, I'm not in the ICU, so I, I can't give you a really good answer there. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, I, I think Gil was referring to the data on length of stay as a, it, it does come out in quite a few studies as a significant predictor of outcome, but of course it is a marker of, of how sick the baby is. Um, hi, I'm Mark Parrish, Pete's cardiology, and I, I too really enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Um, and with regard to blaming the surgeons, as you pointed out before you started the talk, they really are to blame because 40 years ago, these patients would mostly die, and so the problem is their fault because they're not dying <laughs> anymore. Um, so just to correct that particular statement. Duly noted. Um, it is their fault. But I'm, my mind is still struggling, and, and it's partly my simple-minded thinking with a couple concepts here. One is the, that I was intrigued that you get involved in some of the early counseling of families, uh, perhaps even before the baby's born. Uh, I struggle a bit with that when we do it as cardiologists because, um, s especially after this talk, I'll struggle with it because the uh, deficits seem to me so um, complex in a way and so um, different that it's difficult for me in counseling a family who may or may not have a high school education in a, f a fair and balanced way. I can be about as fair and balanced about it, I think, as Fox News can, but, um, but that really probably doesn't serve them that well in understanding what they're going to be or may be faced with since the spectrum is huge. So I don't know if maybe later you can give me some clues as how to do that in a way that is understandable by somebody who, who may have some limitations of their own in terms of exec executive functioning. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, I'm struggling a bit with, with um, the investment that you've made in the ongoing evaluation of these patients is great because uh, your center, if any place, has the volume and the patients to mm -hmm. do that. We can never invest that much in our ongoing evaluation of these patients. We'd love to, but we can't. And to some degree, I'm, I'm not sure that we should because I have, I, and you didn't even try to address this, I'm not sure what we can do if we can't prevent the problem. I, I don't know how many of these kids if it's truly executive function, they're going to respond to the kinds of treatments that are available in the autism program. I, I don't know. I'd like to see the data of how they would respond to the treatments that are available, how they would respond to school interventions and so forth. But um, I, it's, that's a little hard for me right now to <coughs> grapple with as well. So comments or anything? Yeah. Well, it, it's a general problem. You never. Uh, it, you have to know who you're speaking to and tailor your message in a format you think that they can hear. And uh, I think an important message is that the variability that you identified. I mean, some children do quite well, and it's not every child who can't draw the Ray figure or has terrible penmanship. So I think parents can be told about the, the variability and that we don't know where your child, how your child will do. I mean, if the child has seized postoperatively, that gives us a little more information that uh, would help us with, with uh, guidance. But um, I mean, I think we have to be honest and, and tell them the range of potential outcomes and what we know uh, are predictors. Uh, in terms of things that will help, I mean, these are problems that are seen in children without congenital heart disease as well. And, and there are interventions that a, a wide variety available, not all work for all children, but um, I think the important part for the, these children is that someone be looking for the emergence so problems can be caught early and then they can be given the, one, the, the, the interventions that aren't specifically for children with congenital heart disease but 
for all children, any ch child with a particular neuropsychological presentation. I wanted to ask you, um, and, and you actually all already started to go in that direction, um, you've done a lot of, this has been just one piece of a, of a very broad uh, research program that, that you've developed over the years. Um, and most of what you talked about really is, was very specific to these children who fall into this particular category of, of being born with certain heart defects. Uh, what do you see as, or, or do you see a, a, a sort of a generalizability of, of, of lessons from all of this work that might go beyond this particular vulnerable subgroup in terms of where might there be other vulnerable subgroups of children who might have similar sorts of deficits where there's, there's this disconnect between the IQ and a lot of other functions. Um, does it lie in, in other biomedical subgroups potentially or um, environmentally uh, uh, disadvantaged groups of, of some sort or other. Mm -hmm. do, do you see any Well, the example of, of premature babies that was raised earlier, I think, is the, the strongest biomedical uh, generalization from, from this work. Um, perhaps uh, all conditions that produce uh, abnormal white matter development would also um, be relevant. In terms of environmental exposures, I think that's a, a more complicated issue because there we have the timing and dose that uh, come into play, which doesn't really complicate uh, the congenital heart disease uh, issue so much. Um, you know, a given chemical could have a very different effect on a child if it's prenatal exposure versus exposure at five years of age because it's, the nervous system is, is different at those two points. And so uh, the, its impact, both in terms of the severity and in the nature, the specific presentation, neuropsychological presentation, would probably differ, which I think is one reason why we haven't seen behavioral signatures uh, for environmental exposures like lead and mercury and so on, uh, whereas I think we have behavioral signatures for some of these more biomedical conditions uh, like Rett syndrome, uh, Prader-Willi, uh, even the congenital heart disease that, uh, uh, that we don't see for these exposures that vary in their timing. So I think it's probably more generalizable to the biomedical area than environmental exposures. Thank you very much. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.